Can everybody see the screen all right? If I'm kind of in this region and, uh, you good? Okay. And it's, it's not filled to the back of the room, so I don't have to speak super loud this time. <laughs> uh, so this talk's called Water and Transformation in Dryland Systems, Resilient Science and Key Line Application. Um, what we're mainly going to talk about is how water cycle health uh, integrates and transforms dry land systems. So obviously water is a limiting factor in dry land, so it's fairly obvious that how critical it becomes. Uh, but we're going to look at its power to transform dry land systems, as well as a key line application as a specific uh, case study of dealing with the water cycle, of changing the water cycle from a previous degraded condition towards moving towards a more healthy water cycle in a dry land system by the use of the key line plow and key line system. And, and finally, the third part of the talk is going to be uh, about resilient science uh, kind of the cutting edge of sustainability science. And um, there's a huge body of literature behind this that's come out, especially in the last 10 years. And some folks have heard the term resilience, but not, aren't necessarily familiar with the whole background of, of that science. And they have a unique perspective on the world and for understanding systems and how they function that I think is going to be really valuable for permaculture designers moving forward to have some idea of um, and can help us design the trajectories to take this transformation up to global scales. It gives us both a theoretical understanding of how they work, but also a practical understanding through case studies in, in that body of literature. Uh, so the story, the Key Line project mainly that I worked on, um, and that will be the background for this, takes place in southwestern New Mexico. Uh, so obviously it's a dry land situation. It's a farm and community project that started from the ground up. Uh, they didn't own this land at the beginning, but we'll get to that story. Uh, and it's called Whirlwind, so is that is actually what the land looks like at the place that you actually do see a lot of these whirlwinds. Uh, that's, th that's how it got its name. So resilience, we've, a lot of us have heard this term. Uh, it's starting to get used almost as much as sustainability in some circles. Resilience, resilience, you hear it, but what is it? Does it has anybody have, an, have a way they would define resilience or talk about resilience? Kind of a way to bounce back after a shock. A way to bounce back after shock? Absolute, absolutely. And this would be a classic example of what's called engineering resilience. Uh, so a system is in a certain state, it gets disturbed and moved away from that state. How long does it take for it to go back to the initial state? That's a classic uh, engineering resistance, uh, resilience definition. So the kind of resilience that we'll be talking about incorporates this, but it actually takes it a bit further, it's a bit, a bit beyond that. Maybe to prevent? To, to prevent. And, uh, and to adjust before. And to adjust. Before the before the dis disturbance absolutely absolutely so these kinds of things will play into and I'll have a, you know official definition if you will uh, in the course of, of the show but I want to see where people are at with this term because um, we're not necessarily all using it in the same way um, so resilient science is also called social ecological system science um, if uh, I've got the pictures of lenses up here because that's kind of the lens that we're going to look at this whirlwind story through, uh, social ecological system science. And it's kind of at the tail end of kind of a long train in the 20th century uh, leading into this century of, of different types of system science. So uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time here, but just so you kind of know the background, it started out with general systems theory, uh, moving into cybernetics and information theory, chaos theory with Mandelbrot's work. Uh, dissipative systems theory, Prigogine, systems ecology, uh, Odom was very influential there who really influenced uh, David Holmgren and, and Bill Mollison coming up with permaculture also, his, his unique take on how energy transforms through systems. Um, complexity theory, complex adaptive systems theory, network theory, so these things, more and more of them are popping up every day, but right now the cutting edge of this is social ecological systems theory. Um, so what that is, is uh, this is kind of a definition of, of what a social ecological system is. There are complex adaptive systems that incorporate human societies, economies, ecosystems, 
as well as their interactions. And they explicitly recognize that human communities depend on natural resources as well as modifying natural resources by their actions and their mutual feedbacks between these systems. So what they're really arriving at finally in the science is something that even somebody like Yeomans was talking about in the very early 70s. In Yeomans' uh, last book, The City Forest, um, he was kept going on about this HER, Human Environment Revolution, because he explicitly was uh, recognizing the fact that humans and the environment are really uh, connected. You can't really separate these systems. It's a single, it's a single system. So conceptually, you can se treat them separately, but in reality, on the ground, it's a single system. Well, uh, the uh, sustainability science is finally sort of catching up with some of these notions. So some of the themes in resilient science are listed here. I want to talk about all of them because I'll talk about several of them along the way. Um, but what I wanted to point out was that uh, this science emerged in the, also in the early 70s through the work of Buzz Halling, who's in the picture, who's a Canadian uh, systems ecologist. Um, so he was sort of the uh, trigger for a lot of this, but at this point there's quite a huge body of, of literature in this area. Uh, once upon a time, and so we're going to start the story now, right? So you just have to say once upon a time, that's how the story starts. Uh, once upon a time in the uh, Chihuahuan Desert, so this is sort of where we're located with this case study. Um, so the Chihuahuan Desert is uh, quite a large desert. So that arrow there is the location of where this case study takes place, the whirlwind. Um, it's the largest North American desert, uh, as well as a biodiversity hotspot, uh, which there's something like 18 of those defined around the world. Um, so it's quite an interesting, uh, as a dry land, it's quite an interesting place. Got snakes and eagles and stuff like that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so the founder of this uh, community is named Shankar Sharanam. Uh, he's an author and a teacher. He teaches a particular uh, method of breathing yoga, like a pranayama yoga style. And he uh, wanted to found, uh, along with some of his uh, uh, students, a community um, that would be able to teach this, but they also wanted to be as sustainable as they possibly could. And uh, we're very interested in permaculture and some of these ideas and in putting them into practice. So. This property is actually on Whirlwind Road, which is why they, they took the name Whirlwind for their, uh, for their community. And uh, they've got 240 acres. They purchased this in 2006. And uh, this was their property um, in 2006. So, of course, if this term Whirlwind that they named it actually ended up being quite appropriate to the land because that term, of course, is just a name for an erosive process of wind erosion. And um, that's pretty much what you found a lot of when, when you would go to this property. And that's the kind of shape it was in. And we'll go into some of the history of how it got this way um, as we continue with the story. But um, the interesting thing about this is uh, this is actually in quite a stable state at this point, not a state we'd necessarily want to have or is desirable from a human perspective, but it's actually quite a stable state. So uh, stable states and, and system states are part of the resilience science. Um, so there'd be other names for that. Uh, an attractor, a basin of attraction, a stability domain. This is all ways that they talk about uh, stable states in resilience science. And the picture here is, uh, it's of a Lorenz attractor is what that is, which is uh, sometimes associated with the butterfly effect. Has anyone heard, heard of this butterfly effect? So it's, it's, it's a way that systems behave. Um, this is basically a mathematical phase space. Are there any mathematicians in, in the audience that could probably give a better definition of a mathematical phase space? Well, essentially, that's a representation of the system in a mathematical way that incorporates the, every possible phase of the set the system can be in, given the governing variables and so on. Um, so another way to look at this is uh, called sort of the ball in the cup model. Um, and so that's what we have here. We've got this red ball in the orange cup. And if the cup itself represents this uh, attractor, 
this, uh, okay, it's, it is a basin, right? A basin of attraction is the cup. That's at the actual state of the system at any given moment. Um, and, uh, or I'm sorry, that's the attractor of the system. And the state of the system will be represented by the ball itself, which might be rolling around in different configurations. But also the attractor itself can be adjusting over time as well. Um, so if, if you get a disturbance in this system, and it takes this ball up towards the lip of the cup. Um, well, at some point, uh, once that disturbance leaves, the classical engineering resilience would be how quickly would it get back down to the bottom of the cup. Um, but in resilience, we're looking at, does it stay in the cup at all? Uh, more than how quickly does it get down to the bottom? We're more looking at the overall shape of the cup in resilience science. Um, so one way, yeah. Maybe we want it in another cup, and that's where we get to transformation. Transformation, absolutely. So some of the drivers and dynamics of this particular stable state that we encountered when we first uh, went to this whirlwind property, uh, well, these are interacting variables or drivers that are primarily responsible for the phase space, if you will, of, of that particular site. So you've got bare ground, lots of bare ground, that leads to capping and compaction of the soil, leading to reduced soil water, leading to uh, soil and organic matter nutrient loss. And of course, that just the cycle just continues and it continues to one of those uh, downward spiral feedback situations. And it tends to keep that system in that stable state. It's stable in a state that's undesirable. Um, so this brings us to what's called the rule of hand which is something that Buzz Holling uh, came up with, where three to five variables acting at different speeds and scales uh, can produce complex nonlinear system behavior. So it's, we looked at a few variables in the previous slide, uh, but any system at any scale can usually be modeled or described by only three, or three to five uh, of the major drivers, the major variables that basically guide the dynamics that shape the attractor for that particular system. And this, uh, this slice will be available also, just so uh, everyone knows. But what this leads to is the possibility of thresholds and alternative stable states, which we'll talk about. Um, but it's the nonlinearity of those interacting variables that leads to uncertainty and surprise. So that's why these systems are completely unpredictable. Uh, what I would have, so this is a surprising slide, but that was the best I could do. What I wanted to have as a picture, and I couldn't get it before I came here, was one of those uh, jack-in-the-box. Do you guys know these? And you like, it's a box, and you're like, and then the guy pops out of the box. And uh, that's, in a way, the, uh, you've got the drivers, and they're slowly changing, and then the system changes in a nonlinear fashion. It's a surprise. If you don't know that the jack-in-the-box is coming out, that's a surprise. So that's a very mechanical example. This is much more a, a complex thing that they're talking about. But because those variables are so complex, because they're interacting at different scales of both time and space, this produces complete unpredictability, uncertainty, as a fundamental part of the system, and therefore surprises. Talk about it in the connection to ecological succession. It's usually people think about as a, like something that you can predict. Yes, and and it's true that to a degree you can't predict the ecological succession. What they're finding is you can also predict, uh, or we're beginning to understand. Uh, abrupt system shifts, and which we're going to talk about with thresholds, uh, shifts that are completely discontinuous and nonlinear, where the whole state of the system shifts completely to uh, an entire another attractor or stability domain, um, which I think is going to cover that. <laughs> um, right. So unpredictability is in inherent in these systems, and there's a lot of different. What happened there? <laughs> it's uncertainty and surprise, oh my goodness. It's resyncing, it's analog, and it's uh, more attractors. So these attractors are basically describing the boundaries of the system, and the system can be in any of these particular configurations that it's in this one, say just on the red lines, but not in the white areas. 
if that makes sense. So it's completely unpredictable where in those red lines the system might fall in the next moment. Uh, the precise dynamics of that can't be predicted, where it's going to go, but that range of behavior can be completely described. Okay, back to the story, enough of the science. <laughs> so the question because this is the farm in, in 2007, um, I got the opportunity to go up for free and then somebody's uh, private plane and get a couple pictures, which is fun. But you could also kind of see better how it fits into the local context. So the question is, is this in a resilient state? <laughs> should it, I mean, should it, you wouldn't think so necessarily, but at least by some definitions of resilience, it's actually in the state it's in it's quite resilient. It's difficult to move that piece of land out of that particular state. Oh, and is that uh, Whirlwind Road in the foreground? That's exactly right. This is Whirlwind Road right here, which is a dirt road, yeah. but county maintained, um, so to speak. Some, some dwelling in the front, that sort of dark area and squares and stuff. The, an old house used to be here. It was no longer there. Uh, this was an old corral that got uh, removed. And the yoga guy was with his Somewhere in there with the, photo. the who? The yoga guy who runs it. <laughs> that, there's, there's nobody there. No. Nobody there. Yeah, it, was a, it was a former farm, and we'll go into some of that history of how it got here. Just, just one more question. Yes. Is that 100 acres or something? Uh, it's 240 completely, because uh, yeah. some of it goes off this direction a bit okay. as well. Thank you. Yep. Um, so here's sort of the... Resilient science definition, or the social ecological system science definition of resilience, it's the capacity of a social ecological system to absorb disturbance, to sustain its fundamental function, structure, identity, and feedbacks as a result of recovery or reorganization in a new context. Uh, it's, it's all sciencey and wordy, uh, but essentially that's what we're talking about, that sort of rule of hand. It's, it's those variables that describe the function, structure, and identity. That's what gives the system its identity. And so if you can identify it as the same system uh, after a disturbance, then the, it's demonstrating its resilience. Uh, so then we come to uh, one of our, uh, br our favorite Brad Lancaster questions, but one I also uh, teach in holistic management land planning and some of these things. You've got to find out what's the story of the land. What, what happened here? Now, we don't necessarily have to go this far back, but sometimes it's fun to, to, to even check that information out. So, all right, we'll fast forward a little bit up to, uh, so I'll just call it early land use. So this would be back uh, talking about uh, between the 1100s, I think was the height of the civilization that lived in this area at the time would be the Mimbrais people. They were a subset uh, of the uh, Migion culture so we'd be right down in here, uh, basically. And the membrace, membrace actually means willow. So that already gives us a flavor that's a different, a different state than what we see on that farm right now, right? The willow uh, culture. And they actually uh, produced the most advanced ceramics, uh, pre-modern ceramics in North America. Uh, and obviously, they had good relationships with their animal kingdom also hinting at sort of a different state than we found this uh, whirlwind in when we got there. Uh, so some of the land use of the Mimbros folks, and I'll just point out that uh, this red outline here is actually the whirlwind property. Uh, this green outline here is a place where nobody's allowed to dig. It's a bit raised up um, because it's a Mimbros site, an archaeological site. So what used to happen is uh, water used to drain through here. There's mountains to the uh, north of this and mountains to the west. Um, both of those uh, drain water, of course, during storms. There's a confluence of those two drainages, and it comes into what's called the 76 draw, which is this water that uh, at one time, at least, and certainly when the Mimbrace lived there, came through here. So th this whole area was, was really like a flood plain essentially, and of course it's a monsoonal system down here, so they would have experienced those floods during the summer. They get over half the rainfall down there, which is uh, at this time about 8 to 10 inches, uh, well, 250 millimeters is the top then, right? And, uh, but the ranchers will tell you 6 inches, so it's you know, almost half that. Um, I'm sorry, my conversions are not 
great in my head. Uh, but I think you get the gist. So what happened here was they would, in that floodplain, of course, grow opportunistically their corn and, and uh, corn beans and squash. Actually, the, uh, the mountains to the west are called uh, Tres Hermanas, Three Sisters. So I'm not certain that's a reference to corn, beans, and squash, but it certainly is in some circles. Um, so in any case, uh, this would have likely been, up until more recently, there's been a lot of shrub encroachment all across the southwest, including this area. But this would have been a desert grassland at that time, much more hydrated landscape than we see. So what we're talking about is, is in resilience terms, would be an alternative stable state. So that's a completely different state from the one we're seeing at Whirlwind, um, and really regionally, so there's different scales here. Uh, but we're going to call it the alternative stable state for the system. So just by looking into the history, you can kind of see what else is possible, and you can think about it in terms of this, is, uh, this could be another stable state we could move the system towards, that it's, it's plausible for this system in this environment. So, of course, there's the corn they're growing down there, so quite different. So then, how do those systems change? How does that alternative state uh, turn into the one that we see when we get there? Well, in uh, resilient science, they talk about slow variables. The slow variables strongly influence social ecological systems, but remain relatively constant over years to decades, so that those time scales, and usually at larger space scales, these slow variables will operate on uh, that attractor, that system, that stable state, that stability domain. So if these are things like uh, cultural paradigms, because again, it's not just ecological, it's also social system, and they're connected, they're a single system. Economics, uh, types of land use can be slow variables, they change slowly over long periods of time. Governing social values uh, can be slow variables. So again, that rule of hand comes into play. Those are usually the drivers of that attractor state and, and they change slowly. Uh, so in the case of whirlwind, uh, we might be talking about uh, what changed in slow variables from the membrane state. Well, we got the industrial area era between then and, and between when 2006 when we got the land. And then the great acceleration, which would have started in the 1950s and sort of it's all those hockey stick graphs. Actually, I actually think we have them later. Uh, but that's sort of the great acceleration of our human experiment, of our uh, effect on the planet. And of course now we've moved, that has moved us into the Anthropocene as terms of a geologic age, out of the Holocene into the Anthropocene. We'll see if that ends up being a complete regime shift or not. So we started with the meme brace and uh, moving those slow variables, changing those slow variables moved us to the uh, sort of the industrial age, changed uh, uh, changed the dynamics of that system, so we wound up with uh, what we did at Whirlwind. So it's an example of crossing a threshold. What happens is when these variables change slowly, at some point, and it's discontinuous, that's where the uncertainty and the surprise comes into the system, uh, at some point the system flips completely to a new attractor, to a new stability domain, and when a critical level of one or more drivers or state variables uh, triggers this regime shift. And another definition, it's the level or amount of controlling, often slowly changing variable in which a change occurs in a critical feedback, causing the system to self-organize along a different trajectory and towards a different attractor. Uh, so a very, very simplified version of this, not, uh, not a complex resilience definition, would just be the phase transition between ice and water. But you can see there's you know, it's basically the drivers are pressure and temperature. That describes kind of the, the states. And just a simple movement in one way or the other, thresholds can get crossed, and there's a sudden shift to uh, an alternative state. So uh, this, is, this is not kind of the resilience complexity here, but it's just an example of, of what a threshold would be like. So if you imagine that, but much more complex, you get into these regime shifts when thresholds are crossed. These critical transitions is another term for those, and they're abrupt large-scale transitions to a new state, a new stability domain, characterized by very different structure and feedbacks. So that's that new attractor. Um, so it's nonlinear. It's that discontinuity and uh, sort of a catastrophe fold, if anyone's familiar with the whole catastrophe theory and that math. It's, it's, that's all the same stuff, pretty much. It's a cascade. 
So examples in, in ecology are shifts from a grass-dominated state to a woody-dominated state, actually completely different states governed by completely different feedbacks with completely different productive outputs. So if we go back to our ball and cup thing, you know, you, if you started out in a grassland here and the resilience of that state kept getting lower and lower, so the shape of this cup maybe kept getting more shallow and the state of the system represented by the ball actually moves out here and eventually flips completely over into this new domain, which is the woody uh, system. Uh, and of course, the increased woody is, actually gives us sort of less, less of a productive output, ecologically speaking. It may or may not be more desirable, depending on your system. This happens in coral reefs as well. Uh, they can go from this sort of clear and uh, what we would probably call healthy state over here so this would be that uh, domain, or I guess it's here in this, in this picture. Here's the blue uh, system state, that ball. But you can see the shape of this attractor by the time you get to this uh, completely algae-dominated state has shrunk. This attractor has shrunk down. This one has actually grown, and it's flipped over into that new state. So we see this in many types of systems. And another example, and just kind of another way to look at it, if these things are moving uh, at us towards time, and you start with a clear water state in a lake, uh, so you've got your healthy fish, you've got your full uh, web of interactions that are creating the feedbacks to create a, a healthy sort of uh, clear water state, but your nutrients, maybe your phosphorus or nitrates or something, are dripping into the lake like a slow variable, increasing over time, suddenly this, the, system, the system flips into this turbid regime, uh, excuse me, there we are. Uh, so, you know, in any case, you can see this one sort of shrinking, this one sort of growing, and eventually you're left with just that domain. Um, and you get to your notice, algal bloom has made the area unsafe for water contact. So not as desirable, it's a stable state for that system, um, but it's not as desirable from a human perspective, usually. So, you know, that brings maybe bigger questions of, is there a sea ice threshold? You know, this variable has been slowly changing, slowly changing, slowly changing. And then in about 2007, we saw a really discontinuous change in sea ice. Uh, and, you know, so <clears throat> that kind of brings up a question of whether that's a threshold uh, issue or not. We don't know for sure, uh, but, it's, but it's interesting. And whether or not that represents another threshold in, in terms of the climate. Is the climate going to a completely new attractor? at this point is the resilience of this climate, the Holocene, uh, now going into this Anthropocene attractor. So another way to look at this resilience thing, um, I'll borrow this chair, <laughs> is you know if this chair is our system state, you know, and uh, we've got sort of a, this is our, our state, we've got sort of a slow variable that's starting to change the shape and the interactions and the feedbacks, and it's slowly changing over time. The resilience is getting less and less of this particular state. And you know, at a certain point, at first it takes some force to get this thing to go. But you know, at a certain point, just a little fly landing on it and you know, go to a whole new state. Uh, just very abruptly, that surprise in the system, it's unpredictable. But we're starting to learn where some of these thresholds are in at least some systems like coral reefs and so on. So what's the threshold at, at Whirlwind? So we'll go back here now, update or forward from the main brace to the 1950s. And now we've got our uh, hockey stick graphs, a great acceleration. Um, probably, the, of course, atmospheric carbon concentration, I won't read them all. Coastal zone structure, urban population, damming of rivers, maybe the most important one, McDonald's restaurants. Um, it gives us this great acceleration era. And so the land use at Whirlwind at that time for 30 years, starting 1950s, was uh, modern, modern cotton and sorghum farming. And uh, if you know much about sort of conventional cotton farming, it's, it's uh, one of the most, maybe the most uh, sort of damaging monoculture conventional farming there is just because of the sheer amount of, of water and uh, biocides that go into all of that system. So briefly, you know, you've got flood irrigation with all of those issues, evaporative loss, biodiversity loss from the anaerobic conditions, salinization, erosion, fossil aquifer depletion. And, and, and hydrous ammonia as the nitrogen source? 
And what? And hydrous ammonia as nitrogen source, lots of problems. Oh, absolutely. That's the most salty fertilizer. It makes concrete. Leading to the salinization. Something like 25 million acres every year go out of production because of salinization and salt uh, uh, issues in cotton soils. And that's, that's worldwide. So you've got conventional tillage. And this is a photo I actually took uh, probably two miles from Whirlwind. So they're still doing this. Uh, and you can see this conventional tillage happening. It all looks very neat, and then you've got all this kind of wind erosion going on at the same time. But of course, biodiversity loss, reduced till soil structure, all the usual problems that most of us are familiar with, I think, from conventional tilling. You've got uh, your biocidal mania, your basic biocidal mania. Uh, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, nematocides, and I call them the fertilicides. Uh, being these sort of the inorganic fertilizers, because that's actually what they do. They kill the natural fertility of the soil, so we might as well include them in these biocide issues. Um, Elaine Ingham talks about the fact that when the Romans salted the soils in North Africa, they were using lime and gypsum to do that. They wouldn't actually use salt. Salt was a very valuable commodity. Uh, it's part of the root word of salary. They used to pay the soldiers with actual salt. So they're using gypsum salts and lime, uh, liming salts, which now we're dumping on our agricultural lands in a conventional way. So I, I thought this little thing was quite interesting coming off a pesticide can or something. Be careful. <laughs> you wouldn't want to get hurt. So there's also fast variables. We talked about slow variables. Um, there's also faster variables that tend to work on smaller scales and in both space and time. Um, so increasing the chemical load through time there at the whirlwind farm um, and the soil communities approach these thresholds and as they approach you get uh, this complexity diversity reduction you get a reduced resilience you get increasing pest outbreaks you get increasing problem species far less soil organic matter and shrinking yields so we see this all over with conventional agriculture going on but uh, particularly this uh, whole increasing pest outbreaks and problem species the uh, what they've noticed in this resilience science is that these systems, as they approach a threshold, often start to kind of do this wiggling thing. They start to fluctuate uh, more rapidly than their normal rate had been previously. So sometimes that can be a warning sign that your system is about to shift discontinuously. So this would have been circa 1976. It's not an actual photo from Whirlwind. It's a photo of a cotton farm I found online, but this, in 1976, the farmer stopped farming the cotton. He was done. He was just was getting more and more difficult. I actually spoke with him. Uh, he still lives in town in uh, uh, Deming. He's actually now, this is down near the Mexican border, so he's actually now running a Homeland Security uh, a balloon with the infrared camera that he sends way up to watch the border and, you know, see what's going on, and that's his job. Uh, so this would have been, I'm saying, the final harvest after the final harvest at Whirlwind. So, uh, so of course, this had been 30 years before uh, we got involved. Then what happens, this is an actual photo uh, of signs like this in, in all over that part of New Mexico. Zero visibility is possible, and I'm, I'm guessing most of you can imagine why that's possible. <laughs> right, and that's an actual photo from Whirlwind. Uh, some typical wind erosion can create zero visibility conditions. And in fact, uh, the best numbers I could find on the record were for nearby West Texas, which is quite close. Uh, 33 tons of topsoil per hectare per year are documented to be lost uh, by wind erosion in this area. So, yes? As all, like in 78, 79, there was as much dust in West Texas as in the Dust Bowl era. Oh my but goodness. Be, but because then there was no infrastructure, so everybody was suffering. With the only infrastructure in the banks and the cars, people just lived. Amazing. So that's official statistics. I believe it. Absolutely. I should put that in here. <laughs> I knew that that's a whole new slide. I got to do it. It was also the summer before the hottest storm on record up to last year. No kidding. Yeah, up to this year, I'm sorry. We had 110 degrees. For Are you from Texas? Yeah, I lived Wonderful. in Dallas. We have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, the Great Acceleration Era episode two. So we're done with the farming episode. 
And that, then what happens? Well, whirlwind's abandoned and it's exposed uh, for a couple of decades, um, <coughs> uh, starting there at the at the mid to late 70s. And you know, of course, you got more of that. We did our little cute whirlwind traffic. Well, so I'm gonna, basically, what what that means is that for the next 20 years, uh, the tool that was used to manage whirlwind was one called partial rest. In, in holistic management, we call this partial rest, which is a, another framework that I teach. Uh, and what happens, uh, something that Alan Saver identified is there's a huge difference between dry lands and uh, more uh, mesic lands or temperate lands when it comes to uh, the effects of resting those areas from livestock. Uh, so in effect, in a more mesic region, uh, you'll get actually a lot of good succession processes happening when you rest the land from livestock. Um, in these regions, if you do this long term, you have effects that actually degrade. In dry lands, if you rest them from the livestock, uh, they will actually degrade and look just as bad as overgrazed areas after 30, 40 years of complete rest. Can you define dry lands? Uh, dry lands would be anywhere where evaporation uh, exceeds rainfall, exceeds precipitation. Uh, on an annual basis. So there's degrees of that, of course, from hyper-arid to, you know, just semi-arid or, you know, what have you. But, um, but in all of those systems, partial rest would tend to negatively affect that in the long term. They might need some rest for a period of time, but if you, if you continue to rest those systems from herbivores uh, for a long period of time, they will degrade. And th these are things that will happen. I won't read them. You guys can all read. Why? Why is that the case? The <laughs> that's the case because those systems, dryland systems, most of which are grasslands, evolved with herbivores over periods of you know, 30,000 years at least. So these systems co-evolved. You can look at it as a single, a single organism in a sense. So, so those grasses need those herbivores to actually graze them for their growth processes to actually function in the long term. There's not the, they've not, not overgrazing. They need to, those animals need to be bunched tightly. They need to keep moving, just like they were in those systems as they co-evolved. They did this because of predators in the system and they moved on because they fouled their uh, you know they fouled their eating area and didn't want to keep eating there. They just kept moving. I think a nice way to describe it is in a wet system in a in a humid area, the um, biological yeah. microorganisms are in the soil. In a dry land that's right, during the dry season. So in the rainy season, you get them in the soil there also, but once that dries up, that's all you have left is the gut of the herbivore, and of course, uh, you know, they, they deposit that regularly. Um, but that, and that's a kind of a whole other thing, so I won't go too deep into it, but does that basically answer your question? I mean, they've found, they've found in the saliva of some herbivores there, and cows even that, that grasses respond by, uh, to the enzymes there by putting out more growth. And then your scientists will come along and say, well, let me freeze dry that and I'll go test it in the lab. And then it's, well, that doesn't work. You say, well, uh, could it possibly be because he freeze dried it? I don't know. Uh, so more on partial rest uh, all in dry lands, okay? This doesn't apply to, to uh, temperate wet and uh, wetter areas, humid areas often leads to these ecosystem-wide shifts, lower rainfall. Uh, the lower the rainfall, the greater and faster are these adverse effects. So we had 20 years of this, and this picture I took from the plane as well on that same trip. It's just in New Mexico, there's, there's basically uh, open range laws. So if, you're not, if your land's not fenced off, the animals are free to kind of just you know, wander in there and, and do whatever. So that's partial rest. If it, everything had been totally fenced off, we'd call it total rest. Uh, but the effects are pretty much the same in, in dry lands. So it's another picture from the plain, and this was the, this was that former farm, and the condition was in in in, in 2007. Uh, from kind of far back, going closer up, a smaller scale. That's kind of the conditions we had. It's you know, almost a almost a desert pavement kind of situation is emerging here. Um, so that gives us a question from the, from the standpoint of resilient science, are we into an irreversibility situation, uh, also called hysteresis, um, a situation where it's very, very tough, if not impossible, to move that system out of that attractor. Um, and so this reminds us of the story of Humpty Dumpty, because um, he's kind of a classic example of hysteresis or, or irreversibility. You know, once he fell off the wall, uh, all the king's horse, all king's men could not put uh, Humpty Dumpty back together again. It just doesn't work. So 
Another way to think of the, of the hysteresis is the whole uh, straw that broke the camel's back idea. Um, so here you're loading the camel down with straw. The camel's in this state over here, but every, the more and more straw, the less and less resilient. And that final straw, it's like the fly on the chair, uh, shifts that camel into the broken back state. Uh, it's just another way to look at it. Uh, same thing with your grassland to shrubland, you know. It's, it's the same sort of thing. So when, by the time you get to this shrubland state, it actually takes much more energy much more effort to get back to a grassland than it took to go to the shrubland in the first place, if that makes sense. It's, it's a, a, a huge sort of energy differential going on there. Then, and that's the idea of hysteresis or irreversibility. So back at Whirlwind, we did some soil tests just to kind of see what was going on in that particular stable state. And you can see that uh, things were not good. Uh, we did an actual lab test. Um, we had 0.4% organic matter um, in, yeah, 0.4. Uh, and it's sort of the typical pattern in, in that type of farming after that long. Um, probably the original desert grassland was at least three times that, I mean, most likely more, um, <clears throat> but conservatively. And what else we had? Uh, exchangeable or sodium absorption ratio at 45 which anything over about 12 I think you're getting into some troublesome territory there um, and finally there's a specific notes warning sodium affected soil must reclaim from sodium to avoid soil structural issues gypsum is suggested however in the presence of soil lime a pound of elemental sulfur five pounds of gypsum I think that's per acre follow five times so this starts to be quite expensive to rehabilitate this from a conventional laboratory perspective. I probably should, uh, I probably should find out the actual cost that that would be and stick them in this, in this show, but I haven't. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so we know where we are. This is where we are. We've got this hysteresis scenario. So I, I got the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> eco-site description from the National Resources Conservation Service which is part of the United States Department of Agriculture. This is what they say about that particular uh, part of the land, the soils that are on that land in that region. So if erosion and high surface salinity and reduced infiltration restrict grass abundance, restoration is probably impossible. <clears throat> so we're thinking hysteresis. Another concept is in, in the system science is path dependence, the effects of historical legacies on the future trajectory of a system. So this is kind of going back to that butterfly effect in essence where, where at the beginning of, of a new system the initial conditions are so important to w what else is able to unfold in that system. Those initial con conditions are almost just like the seeds of everything else that's able to happen. So they become really critical. That's path dependence. Um, <clears throat> so the hydrology at Whirlwind, when we looked into this, kind of that whole region uh, had this modern era hydrophobic paradigm that Brad Lancaster talks about so well, uh, where rainwater is a problem and a threat and it's to be shed from the landscape as rapidly as possible. That's really uh, maybe a slow variable of a cultural paradigm uh, that, has, that has developed over many years and, and is relatively well entrenched, in, especially in this area. Um, so here's the site of the uh, whirlwind down here in the red and what we had remember we used to have the 76 draw in that alternative attractor membrane state uh, well what they had done about 40 years before was put a mile long trench where this pink thing is that would capture the whole entire 76 draw and send it out this way in order to be able to control their irrigation timing uh, down here so they could dump the sort of fossil uh, salty aquifer water on here instead of this nice fresh uh, flooding from the rainwater now, same deal over on, on this runoff that would come off from the Tracer Monas Mountains over here. They put in just a, a berm, a diagonal berm, uh, that also <coughs> deflected all any possible sheet flow uh, from coming into the site. So the hydrology of this particular property was uh, completely different from historical uh, conditions. <coughs> but interestingly, this photograph was taken about right here on another farm where they used to have some irrigation infrastructure. This is concrete. Uh, this has been busted up by flooding. So this overtops, the floods still come back through here. The 76 draw wants to run. 
That's what it wants to do. And it'll take concrete out of its way. And just over time, it will run eventually. Uh, and it's getting there. But uh, so you can see kind of the power of that. I was impressed by that, just kind of walking across that land and finding these, these crumbled irrigation works. Uh, so wait, I did that already, right? No, I didn't. I'm watching that, and I'm watching that. OK, good. So that's more sort of example of the hysteresis. So another thing from the uh, NRCS report, interruption of overland water flow, like, for example, by a road, uh, may reduce soil water availability to the point where plants die and cannot reestablish. These factors may lead to long-term soil degradation. And uh, I think they're, they're correct about that. <clears throat> so that's where adaptive capacity, another co concept from social ecological system science comes in. And it's the capacity of system actors to manage resilience, which we've already defined. It also could be seen as the capacity of human actors, individuals, and groups as the social end of that system to respond to, create, and shape variability and change in the state of a system. So that's the adaptive capacity of a system. So kinds of approaches we wanted to use with our adaptive uh, capacity were uh, key line, permaculture, holistic management. These are the sorts of things we were thinking about and just trying to frame uh, how we understood what was happening in this landscape and how we understood what to do about it. And the main focus of what we wanted to do about it, we decided was going to be the water cycle, is healing the water cycle. And so that's, that's what I'm partly talking about today in water and transformation in dryland systems, is how critical and what an integrating and transforming uh, driver of those systems that the water cycle is. If, that if you can get that water cycle working, most of the other parts of the system are going to come into uh, where you want them to be. That's a key variable. So we did our sector analysis and, uh, you know, of course, the old 76 draw comes through here. So this was our, our flooding sector. Of course, the Mimbrace used to plant into that floodplain. We knew it, it flooded relatively frequently. Uh, and we're hoping that it would flood again as soon as uh, we got the key lining done. So as part of that, we did our water catchment analysis, uh, which actually the catchment that feeds this turns out to be huge. I mean, this is on the order of a thousand square miles. Or so I mean, water falling up here is realistically in the same event, never getting hit down here. But just to give us an idea of what we're dealing with and what the uh, possibilities might be. So, but just direct on the 240 acres in a, in a one, e one inch event uh, would be, uh, an awful lot because I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. But it's quite a lot of water because that's, what is it Brad, it's 27,000 gallons to the acre which doesn't translate well to an international audience. So uh, I'll move on. <laughs> it's a, it's a lot of, awful lot of water, let me put it that way. Just a quick question, if you go back to that slide. Yes, please. Um, what's the boundary of blue boundary? The blue... Well, unfortunately, the, in this slide, I, I uh, is on a geological map and not a topographic map. Uh, so that's the confusion there. The, the property is pretty tiny down here, but this would be roughly the, the if it was a topographic map, uh, I think you would agree. So I'm sorry about that. I should change that. <laughs> it is confusing. But here, here's a whirlwind from the satellite. It's sort of this uh, giant glaring piece of bare ground. Uh, out in the middle there. So this would be the Trace Hermanas, those are the Floridas Mountains that and they confluence into the 76 draw that used to run through there. Um, but you can see uh, the kind of shape that that's in. So we got decided to do use the key line process as, as a fast way to tr hopefully jumpstart the water cycle out there. I think you could, you could actually use grazing to do this. Not that there's anything to graze, you'd have to bring in the organic material. Uh, but it would take longer, and, uh, and we were looking for something, something relatively quick. Uh, so we did our concert survey. Uh, we brought in our plow. It's a seven ton, it's an L439. Uh, we did our pattern ripping uh, across that landscape, and we waited for rain. But of course, the ripping is, was the preparation for the summer monsoon, which we were really hoping would be good, but there's no guarantee. Um, whether it was good or not, we, we were at least prepared. And then, that was a, it's a 200 horsepower, it's a Caterpillar. They don't still have that tractor, but um, 
Yes. Yes. That's right. It was in the shot, right? Oh. Um, so that summer uh, turned out to be not too bad. So here came the rain. Uh, this brings us to uh, another concept from, from resilient science that's cross-scale interactions. The way that different scales in a landscape and in a social system will interact to produce effects. So processes, networks, linking dynamics of a system to events that occur at other times and other places. So rainfall is actually a good example of a cross-scale interaction. Uh, what produces the rainfall are things in other, uh, that are more regional and even can scale up to global weather patterns. Uh, which actually also that wind erosion we looked at earlier is also another cross-scale interaction and the bare ground insofar as bare ground produces more of the convective currents that get up into the atmosphere which makes more wind which makes more wind erosion uh, so on and so forth so there's a lot of if you start thinking about these systems and the cross-scale interactions start looking at things with that perspective you'll start seeing much more the links and how things are connected and, and maybe what we can do with those feedbacks. So then uh, it rained enough that we got a little runoff started in the area because there's a, a lot of bare ground around there. Then we got another cross-scale interaction, uh, you know, at, at least at the local regional scale of flooding. Um, and that gave us some good, uh, some good results and this is the whirlwind property after that rainfall. We got pretty much the annual average uh, in a 24-hour period that summer. And fortunately, we're prepared to, to capture all that and put it into, into the soil and to start to heal that water cycle. Have you seeded it when you did the plowing? We, uh, we did seed a small portion, um, and that, that, that actually gets to the next slide, but uh, seeding was not necessary because of another concept, system memory. <laughs> so those are seeds, it's not, I mean, those are huge seeds, those are not what really grew, but it's hard to get, show you a photo of a little, little tiny seeds, uh, or I didn't have one. Uh, in any case, seeds are part of system memory. They interact across scales through the flooding events. Um, there was probably some still in those soils that had just been dormant waiting for conditions that they could emerge. And let's imagine they call it the spring, and you take your foot off the spring and it, and it jumps up. Uh, so that's, that's part of system memory. We did seed a few acres with some rye, some oats, and a few other things. I did not see one of those plants. <laughs> so the trigger was the increased soil humidity as a result of the pea line plowing. I think that was a very strong variable, the soil moisture availability. Absolutely, and some of it, and, and some of it may have been some of the seeds that it could have washed in from off the site. How far down did you go with the No, we went down uh, about a foot, about a foot, and deeper in a few places uh, because we were planning to put trees on the borders and things. So we went deeper for that, but the rest of it are, are right around a foot. That's a no-no for key line. <clears throat> Not according to the Yeomans Company. Yeah, how much of it? Yeah, no, I spoke with them. <laughs> yeah, not according to them, that's, yeah, you used to in the old days start at three inches, or now they say eight inches to a foot. Uh, uh, if, if, give them a call. Tell, report back to me if Alan they tell you that? different. Sorry? Alan said that? Uh, Alan said that? No. It, that Al, Keith said that. Keith Ryan, who works at the Yomes Company. I don't know if he still works there. Seven times. Seven times. So another aspect of system memory, of course, seeds are fairly obvious, and that's, that's the ecological part of it. But you've also got so, social portions of system memory. So like your old people. you got these old guys, and they're part of... Uh, they're part of it. Um, hey. So and also sort of path dependence relates to system memory. It's because sometimes that, uh, the seeds are, are, are the knowledge that's in the community that can come into maybe a new system can be those initial conditions that you need that will lead to that uh, new stable state, that uh, desirable attractor that you're after. So back to, uh, to Whirlwind in the summer 2008, just uh, this is I'm standing out at Whirlwind Road to take this photo, uh, looking more or less to the southwest. And so you can see here, as this water uh, came flooding into this property, it, it completely like spread out, slowed down, and sank in. 
just like this sort of mantra, right? And you can sort of see this because all the energy was out, came out of the water so that it dropped its organic material load, and we just got a bunch of free molds kind of dumped at our, at our doorstep. Um, but so that's kind of an example, uh, or, you know, seeing that mulch kind of tells you that, you know, how, how it changed the path of that water, the uh, speed of that water and the energy in that water. So that takes us to uh, the concept of transformability, um, also a concept in this resilient science, which is a capacity to create a fundamentally new system when ecological, economic, or social conditions make the existing system untenable. Transformability. So if we go back to the satellite view, the, again, this is whirlwind down here, this sort of giant bear patch uh, in the landscape. And that's before and afterwards. It's a little reduced. So I'll go back and forth a couple times. You can, you can kind of see it there. Uh, here's a closer up example. Here's the farm. There's a lot of glare coming off that from space. And then it gets much softer in the after covered with grasses, as you can see uh, from this one, which is a little closer scale than, than space. <clears throat> so in October, we did some soil assays. So after that summer, the pH of all these soils dropped uh, very significantly. Of course, it's a logarithmic scale, so that's you know dropped by a 1,000 times, essentially. The salinity uh, was just about 60% reduction down to a, a non-saline soil class. The salt was uh, dropped out of the, the upper profile, so it sunk down further in the, into the profile. Well, into the plants, you said? Yeah. You know, I would think it sunk below the root zone of these plants, at least. Because these are all early annual succession sort of species that came in here. Uh, your compaction, of course, is greatly reduced. Uh, your water infiltration rates, and that's the test I'm doing there, 11 times faster, and I tested about five different areas for these numbers, um, and it, it just kind of uh, averages them. So, yes? It actually does wash through the profile. In fact, that's a technique that farmers sometimes use, is they'll irrigate to wash the salinity down. Uh, Oh, if that salinity ends up in the groundwater? I don't know. Does anybody know? Um, I can comment somewhat on that, that in Israel they used a lot of fertilizers on the, um, on the coast, on the coastal plain, like when they were kicking off agriculture in the 50s and 60s, and they're showing up now in the aquifer and they're having to close wells, like quite a lot of them, because that is a major drinking water source and it's dropped below acceptable drinking water standards. Makes sense. Would, yeah. Will the salt, why you, I don't, if the salt gets washed down in the soil mm -hmm. profile, mm -hmm. as it dries out, why doesn't it wick back up again? Some of it back? probably will. Some of it has that potential, I believe. No, it won't do that because the roots take the salt water up rather than if a uh, capillary rise. So as soon as you have the plant growth, the salt, salt doesn't come up. And the other important factor with the desalinization is the activation of the microbes. And Absolutely. the microbes complex the sodium. Yes. Yes. So the plants can't see it. So there's multiple there. pathways for desalinization. Yeah. Absolutely. So just so you don't think it's uh, just a fact that we got all the rainfall for the year in a day, we had uh, basically a control plot because there was a section that used to be part of the same cotton farm, same cotton and sorghum farm. So it had the same treatment. It's right next door. It's just a part of that prop former property that the, uh, this current owner didn't purchase. Uh, so that was, you can kind of see in this, in this photo. And what happened there was, uh, I already said that, it was the same stable state as whirlwind, right? Same soils, vegetation, same climate, all that stuff, but no key line. What did we see? We saw some new vegetation, although less than 25% growth per plant compared with the plants growing on whirlwind. Very significantly less. Also, 80% bare ground remained. No regime shift happened here on that property. No water cycle healing. So this is another photo on whirlwind from that same uh, October. Uh, this is basically where a coyote spent the night. 
essentially. So you've got predators back in the system, essentially in a season. You've got much more diversity of plants. Well, you've got plants uh, <laughs> back in this system. You've got, by a year later, you've got ground nesting birds. You've got amphibians. You've got soil litter coming back into the system. So I'm going to suggest that's the regime shift. It's an entrainment to a new attractor. It's a new stable state, stability domain, and it's a system transformation. So we've seen all this before, so you guys get that concept, I reckon. Uh, so you know, we lowered the resilience by, of the original state by doing that key lining. So that lowered the resilience of the undesirable state. And uh, the disturbance was the flood. Um, and that created that nonlinear abrupt shift to that new attractor, discontinuous, the threshold crossing event. So this brings us to what's called the adaptive cycle. It's another part of, of this resilient science framework that I think is pretty exciting way to look at all kinds of systems, social and ecological and combined. Um, and so it's kind of in this shape of infinity. It's a cycle, it's about how change happens in systems. Um, so this part of it would be sort of, they call it exploitation or growth. It's the classic beginning of a successional process. And this tends to happen slowly. It's why the arrows are short here. So it moves into more of a conservation phase. Uh, which then moves into a faster, and that's, that's called the front loop, exploitation to conservation. And then that moves into a back loop, which is a much faster part of the cycle, uh, the release and the reorganization phase. But I'll go into some more detail uh, as we go along. So if we start with, uh, if we imagine this is that four box model, but we're talking about a forest. What's the adaptive cycle of a forest? Well, you start in this kind of early successional stage. Those initial conditions are important as to how that system begins to develop uh, that butterfly effect. And then that's going to move up towards this conservation phase rather slowly, but eventually you, get, you do get to this old growth forest. Uh, now all the nutrients, all the information, the energy in the system is very sort of locked up. The system is much more connected uh, to itself. Uh, and it's, it's a conservation, so that's why I call it a conservation state. It's con conserving all the elements of the system in the structure of the system. Then what happens is, as a result of that, usually, uh, say the trees get close enough together that something like uh, a small forest fire can, can turn big into this abrupt, uh, discontinuous, regime-shifting type of event in a release phase. So, so that's, you know, it's so that uh, infinity loop, so we're going down this way now. And after that, uh, you get to the renewal phase, where once again, the, the system memory kicks in, the initial conditions, and uh, reorganization takes place, and the cycle begins again. So that's where that, you know, after that renewal phase, that path dependence comes back into play, the system memory, sort of all, all of those things we've talked about. Um, sort of another way to look at this is in, in uh, physics in the last 10-15 uh, years also is called self-organized criticality. Has anybody heard of this? Um, it's, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to go into it, but their basic image is the sand pile. And the, the similarity here is that there's total unpredictability in the system that as you add grains of sand to this pile, they're behaving as individual elements, not as a single system up until a critical threshold, which is completely unpredictable at which that threshold will emerge. But when it does, avalanches will happen on the sand pile. And those avalanches will follow a logarithmic pattern in their size. So it might be uh, you know, 10 grains big, or 100 grains big, or 1,000 grains big, or 10, and so on. Um, <clears throat> but you don't know which, total uncertainty as to which will happen. But you know one of them will when that threshold is crossed. There's tons of literature on that too, but that's, that's <laughs> so it's kind of related, but I'm not going to go into there. So what, what I want to show here is again, moving this, as we move this way in the system, the connectedness of the system is increasing um, and is, is maximized. As we move this way, it's the capital, the amount that's passive or active uh, is, is changing. Um, so that's why 
like in terms of that forest fire example, the connectedness part, when the forest is not extremely, and all the trees aren't extremely close together on regional scales, you can get a fire in that system and it doesn't spread all over the place. But as soon as it's really connected like that, it'll create a change across the whole region instantly just because of that connectedness element. Um, is that exit arrow suggesting a move to a new attractor? That's right. There's a possibility of in the reorganization phase of a move to a new attract. Ex exactly right. I should have mentioned it. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> so another layer of this. You guys ready for one more layer? <laughs> no, how much? Uh, panarchy. What the panarchy is, we kind of back to these cross-scale interactions we talked about. Uh, so if these are adaptive cycles that are describing nested uh, scaled systems. So maybe at this scale we're dealing with a field at whirlwind. Maybe at this scale it's kind of the region whirlwind is in. Maybe at this scale it's global or something like that. So these are large and slow variables in that adaptive cycle. Small and fast variables in this adaptive cycle. Now what can end up happening is a regime shift say at this small scale uh, this uh, release phase here also sometimes called the revolt phase can actually scale up to affect the scale above it and send that, depending on the state of that system and where that, this system is in the adaptive cycle, they can all be at different places, it could trigger a regime shift in that system and the scale above it. And then likewise, this, the larger system, these cross-scale interactions, the remember phase, the system memory, can go back down to smaller scales. So, Whirlwind showed a lot of new grass growth. Maybe some of those seeds came from a scale larger than that, that field. And of course, we can't forget the social part of this. I think a good example of this panarchy has happened in this region recently, from the small scale of a fruit vendor uh, all the way up to the scale of, of an, an entire region and, and ultimately there's just global effects to this. Regime shifts. So it's social, ecological. Uh, well, we saw that slide, but so in the social systems, it could be uh, changing, very, like a new uh, government emerges. Those conditions start to change uh, over time. It's a su governmental succession. Eventually, all the money and power gets locked up in a conservation phase. Uh, the people can't access that, and a release phase happens, and then reorganization. I think we're seeing that. So a little bit more on whirlwind, and we're almost done. Anybody want to keep going? But <laughs> don't want to keep keeping you if not. Um, the next lab test we did it was in 2010. We had 0.54 organic matter. So that's a 0.14% increase in organic matter in those soils, uh, which isn't terrible. It's, it, it's an increase. Uh, it's going the right direction. Um, so carbon is, is resilient uh, for this system. Uh, that basically gives us about 960 tons of soil organic carbon then that got uh, added to the system. Um, Under what conditions are, are Oh, well, I would bet that falls in there somewhere and, and is maybe relatively quick, but I'm not certain. And uh, forgive me because my, my metrics are, are poor <laughs> as far as the metric system. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> but uh, in terms of atmospheric carbon, that's uh, uh, you know, 3,525 tons. Um, so that accounts for, I think, the average person in the U.S. at least is somewhere around of uh, 20 tons a year, something like that, direct. Um, so you know, it's, starting to, it's starting to have a, an impact. Um, and in additionally, in terms of the water cycle, 
just through the organic matter part alone, nothing about the soil physical structure or the, you know, the water being stored in the, in the uh, grooves from the plow, but just from the organic matter, 26,000 gallons of new uh, water storage over this 40-acre uh, property, or 240 acre. The soil sample is only the surface sample? Yes. So no depth? Uh, to four inches. Uh, so additionally then in 2010, this was actually in the springtime. Um, <clears throat> these are not desirable plants, but in the state we were in before, any plant is desirable. But you know, for our ultimate ends, not desirable plants, these particular ones I'm standing by, but they're green. Uh, no other farms, no other uh, properties in this area at this time of the year, which is the driest time of the year in this area, before the monsoons show up, were showing any green at all. And this was uh, two years after, two years after, these plants are greening up. So these plants are growing longer because they have the, the moisture available. They're growing, their growing season is longer. They're storing carbon for a longer period of time, creating roots for a longer period of time. All the good things that result from that, that all of us are, are familiar enough with, I don't have to review. Uh, but it, this also adds 25,000 pounds of nitrogen at 104 per acre. Um, and at 2008 fertilizer prices, that's approximately $14,000 worth of nitrogen. Uh, it adds 3,400 pounds of phosphorus and sulfur, uh, about 14 to the acre. At, at 2008 prices, that's uh, about 3,100 uh, US as well. So it's just some cost savings going on there too. And again, it's that water cycle, that, that soil moisture enabling this. So uh, what I'm hoping for here is something like a panarchical transformation. Um, so we talked about this panarchy. We've got a little, another Christine Jones, we've seen her come up in a bunch of talks, I think, um, but just about the uh, soil carbon issues um, and their ability to, to address some of the climate change uh, potentials. Um, so panarchical transformation. Uh, Ordinary pursuits of farming and grazing are in themselves a means of inducing an ever-increasing fertility in the soil. That's yeomans. To prevent topsoil losses, repair, rehabilitate damage and compacted soils is a primary design strategy. That's uh, the old man in our system, uh, system memory, Bill Mollison. The restoration of healthy soils is the biggest hope for immediate salvation, Alan Savory. So what I really want to suggest, at least for dry lands, is that all of these things really uh, come down to you can integrate and focus on the water cycle repairing the water cycle repair does this um, so where we are uh, this is somebody's idea at least of where we are kind of globally as a social ecological system they're thinking we're sort of the uh, starting entering the back loop if you will we're starting into this release phase at a global scale um, moving out of the conservation phase and into that release phase. And what I want to suggest is that uh, we together uh, create this permaculture attractor so that we're ready for that back loop, so that when we hit that reorganization phase, that uh, what we're doing today, that what we're doing in the near future is creating those initial conditions that are so critical to how the system self-organizes after that release phase. Um, and so back to that sort of butterfly effect attractor, which reminds us of the importance of those initial conditions. And also kind of interesting maps onto that adaptive cycle, uh, infinite loop, uh, where the system is, is, is poised right now globally on that threshold or is in the midst of crossing that threshold. And in systems terms, this is actually the time when the very tiniest actions, it's that butterfly effect, the very tiniest actions have the greatest effects in how the system reorganizes afterwards. And that's why I think the permaculture attractor is so important. Um, and that's all I got to say. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for